For my thoughts on all the latest happenings in the NFL in a completely relaxed, unscripted format, be sure to check out my channel, JG9 News. And now, on with our feature presentation. I want to give you a bizarre hypothetical scenario that might end up getting a general manager fired if this happened today. This player right here is UCF quarterback John Reese Plumley, and there is a chance that in two weeks, as of this video, he will hear his name get called at the 2024 NFL Draft by some team. It won't be any time early on, but sometime past round 5, it is very possible. Now let's say that in this hypothetical example, the Jacksonville Jaguars decide to draft him as their third string quarterback, and decide to take a chance on yet another UCF guy like they did with Blake Bortles back in 2014, albeit with significantly lower stakes. The pick is made, General Manager Trent Bulky comes up to the podium and talks to the media about the pick, and he says absolutely nothing positive whatsoever about Plumlee. To the point where you're scratching your head and wondering why the heck they drafted him in the first place. Bulky says things like, He's a very inaccurate quarterback. He's got no chance at making the roster. I don't like his attitude. And I'm not surprised he fell this far, because he's not very good. You would look at Bulky like an idiot, and you would think to yourself, So, uh, if, if you don't like this guy... Why on earth did you draft him? Why are you punching him down? Why are you so negative about one of your own players that you drafted, presumably, because you thought he was good or at least had some potential? It's almost like the guy who decides to go to a restaurant by himself that he knows he hates because the food is trash. Like, you had the decision to not go there, so why did you? Something like the scenario involving this man right here would seem to defy all logic, wouldn't it? Well, as stupid and as ridiculous as that sounds, that's exactly what happened at the 1988 NFL Draft when it came to the New Orleans Saints and this man right here, San Diego State quarterback Todd Santos. When the Saints drafted Santos, you'd think that they would praise him, seeing how impressive of a college career he had, and seeing how, at least on paper, it looked as though they got a steal, as no one had him falling that far down the board. However, when General Manager Jim Thing spoke to the media about why the Saints drafted Santos, he made some, shall we say, ridiculous comments that made you not only wonder if he had a head injury, but made you wonder how the heck this guy could potentially be the favorite to take over for Pete Rozelle as the next commissioner of the NFL. This is absolutely baffling. Because this is the story behind San Diego State quarterback Todd Santos, the New Orleans Saints, and what has to be, Considering the circumstances, the dumbest draft pick, or at least one of the dumbest draft picks, in the near 60-year history of the New Orleans Saints franchise. Before I talk about this man right here and what exactly the Saints said that left people completely befuddled and bamboozled, we need some context to understand just who Todd Santos was, how good he was in college, and how his draft day was going in the first place. The year is 1988 and Todd Santos is leaving San Diego State after four years there from 1984-87, as not only the most accomplished quarterback in the history of the Aztecs, but as one of the most accomplished quarterbacks in the history of the NCAA. And I do not say that lightly. There is a reason why Santos is one of just four players in program history to this day to have his number retired, because he was a household name and helped put San Diego State on the map for the average college football fan. In fact, by the time his collegiate career was done, he held a Division 1A record for most passing yards in a career, throwing for a whopping 11,425 yards. In 1986, he was so good that, as the starting quarterback, he got in the Aztecs not just to an 8-4 record and a 7-1 record in conference play, but to their first conference title since 1974, and their first bowl game, the Holiday Bowl, since 1969. So long ago, that man landed on the moon. The late 70s and early to mid 80s were rough for the Aztecs, but with Santos under center, they became a formidable opponent and one of the better teams in the WAC. And for his final season, he had maybe the greatest season by any player in San Diego State history at the time, and to this day, a season that has probably only been surpassed by everything that Marshall Falk did in the first half of the 90s. In 1987, Santos had 3,932 passing yards, which not only led the WAC, but led the entire NCAA. This made him, to date, the final player in San Diego State history 
to accomplish this feat. His 306 completions not only led the WAC in 1987, but also led the entire NCAA, making him to date the final player in San Diego State history to accomplish this feat. And in 1987, his 26 touchdown passes, or an average of more than two per game, not only led the WAC, but also led the entire NCAA, making him not just the last player to date to do this for the Aztecs, but making him the first player since Brian Sype in 1970, who would be named the MVP of the NFL a decade later in 1980 with the Cleveland Browns. You get the idea. Todd Santos was a great quarterback. He's finally remembered to this day with the Aztecs for a reason, and he was one of the best collegiate quarterbacks to ever play the sport at the time, which you kind of have to be in order to end your career first all-time in career passing yards. However, just because you're a great college quarterback does not mean whatsoever that your skills will translate over to the NFL and you'll be highly scouted and looked at. Hawaii quarterback Colt Brennan, rest in peace, led the NCAA in touchdown passes in 2005 and 2006, and he didn't get drafted in 2007 until late in the sixth round. Houston quarterback Case Keenum led the NCAA in touchdown passes in 2009 and 2011, and he didn't get drafted in 2012 at all. And Boise State quarterback Bart Hendricks led the NCAA in touchdown passes in 2000, and he didn't get drafted at all in 2001, never even signing on with a single NFL team. And many scouts had Santos as one of those quarterbacks, really good in college, but probably didn't have the skills to necessarily translate over to the NFL. His deep ball was a bit inconsistent. He didn't do a great job escaping pressure. A lot of his yardage came on simple passes over the middle of the field, angle routes, screen routes, and completions within 8 yards of the line of scrimmage. He didn't have the best ball velocity. He was good, but he might not have been NFL good. One scouting report said on Santos, he built his yardage record with short-range stuff. Does he have the arm? Mel Kuyper Jr. had him outside the top 150 on his big board, and didn't have him listed in the first six rounds of his mock draft. Now, there were some believers on Santos, as he was rated as the third highest scoreback in the draft who was eligible for the first time, according to writer Vinny DiTriani, only below Mike Perez and Chris Chandler. Joel Bushbaum of Pro Football Weekly had Santos at number 70 on his board, as the sixth best quarterback in the class, and as an early fourth round pick to the Philadelphia Eagles. He said on Santos, Santos is good enough to play in the NFL, but is not special and should not be rated as the top quarterback in the draft. And the Miami News also had him as the third highest rated quarterback in the draft behind Chandler and Perez. So the general consensus was mixed, but it seemed as though based on what Santos was hearing and based on the projections available, that this man right here was going to get drafted somewhere in round five and at worst, no later than round seven. Which is why it came as a surprise that when the New Orleans Saints eventually drafted him, it was all the way in the 10th round with pick number 274, way later than anyone thought. The all-time leader in passing yards in college was completely shafted by the NFL. You had eight quarterbacks hear their name called before Santos, including Tom Duba of Phoenix in round three, Chris Chandler of Indianapolis in round three, Don McPherson of Philadelphia in round six, Scott Seculis of Dallas in round six, Stan Humphreys of Washington in round six, Mike Perez of the New York Giants in round seven, Kerwin Bell of Miami in round seven, and Bud Keys of Green Bay in round ten. As a side note, to learn more about the selection of Keys, click the card in the upper right corner. Santos was the ninth quarterback off the board. He was chopped liver. He was stunned. Said Santos, I was disappointed that I didn't go higher. With his agent, Steve Richardson, saying on the news, I thought he would go to Philadelphia. However, at least on paper, even though this was disappointing, it seemed as though the Saints got an absolute steal in the 10th round. They just got college football's all-time leading passer in round 10, about four or five rounds past where just about everyone projected him to go. So when general manager Jim Finks took to the podium to talk about the signing and to explain why the Saints chose him, what do you think things said? What would make sense? You could say, we like this team coming out of college, and with the value on the board in the 10th round, we had to stick to our board and take him. You could say, he's the all-time leading passer in college football for a reason, 
and I look forward to seeing what he can do here with us. You could say, Santos has a lot of potential, and we thought in the 10th round that we'd be crazy not to take him because of what he did in college and what he showed us. All of these are acceptable answers. All of these are fairly boring and bland answers, and all of these are fairly generic front office speak. But all of these answers work, and this becomes a complete non-story more than 35 years later. But oh no, oh no, 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 no. Jin Fangs decided not to do that. Because when Fangs spoke with the press about why the Saints drafted the man they've been watching this whole time, San Diego State quarterback Todd Santos, he basically said, in no uncertain terms, that this man was not good and that the man could not play. Just straight up, this man is not a good quarterback. As Fink said on the selection of Todd Santos, Todd Santos had a very impressive college career, but he still has a long way to go before he becomes a professional quarterback. He'll have to speed up his delivery. He has what I call a lazy arm. That's right, folks. The Saints drafted a quarterback that, by their own admission, had a lazy arm. Always a good sign. And if that wasn't enough, things said on Santos and his arm strength, I don't think he has a real strong arm. And if that somehow still wasn't enough, things said, we might get lucky, or he might just be a camp quarterback. So let me get this straight. According to Finks, the Saints just drafted a quarterback who is not pro ready, who has no arm strength, who has a lazy arm, and who will only be good for them if they somehow get lucky. How does that make any sense? Seriously. How the heck does that make any sense? Honestly, what am I missing here? It'd be one thing if things said that there were a lot of holes in the game of Santos that he needs to work on, but we like his potential, and we think we can fix them and turn him into a good quarterback. But nope, he just said he's not that good. He can throw well. He does have a quick delivery, and uh, yeah, that's what we have to say about that. It raises the obvious question. Why the heck would you draft him then? I get that it's a 10th round pick. And I get that these picks have a massive uphill climb to make it onto the roster. From pick number 265 of round 10 to pick number 277, so the second half of the 10th round or thereabout, of the 13 guys taken, just two of them ended up making it onto an NFL roster at some point. Not a single player from pick 274 on so when the Saints ended up selecting Santos, made a Pro Bowl. And outside a handful of guys, and I truly mean a handful, like Dwayne Harper in round 11, and Brian Kinchin in round 12, there's not a lot to write home about, as most of these guys didn't end up making the roster. But still, if you're going to choose a player, at the very least, choose someone that you like. Choose someone that you have something, anything, to say about that is positive. You don't have to go out and say that you think Santos will eventually become a starting quarterback and that you were enamored with it. You don't have to say he's the next Archie Manning, but don't do this! Don't say, well, we drafted him, but he's not very good. Because in that case, you should choose, quite literally, anyone else. And you might remember that when it comes to the situation involving this team behind me right here, the New Orleans Saints, that this wasn't even the first time that something like this happened in the 1980s. At the 1981 NFL Draft, the Pittsburgh Steelers in round 12 chose Pitt quarterback Rick Trocano. And owner Art Rooney said that he was not very good and he reminded him of a quarterback that couldn't throw the football. You can learn more about that by clicking the card in the upper right corner. Shocker, he never played a single snap in the NFL at quarterback and never played a single game with the Pittsburgh Steelers because of course he didn't. Why would he? The Steelers thought he was terrible and they drafted him many ways. Why do teams do this? Seriously, it makes no sense. If you don't like a prospect, don't lift him! Turns out, Jim Thinks was 100% right on Todd Santos, because he was not a very good quarterback at the professional level. It raises the question of why Thinks drafted him if he knew that Santos was not going to be good. But Santos never played a down in the NFL. He was cut after the 1988 preseason, and was going to be brought back in 1989 to try and compete in training camp but he stupidly broke his finger while playing basketball, and the Saints decided that they wanted no part of him after that, meaning that Santos in his professional football career, however brief it was, was finished after the 1988 season without playing a single competitive game or a single competitive snap. Jim Thinks was right. He had a lazy arm. He had no arm strength. 
He had his flaws. He was not a pro quarterback. And yet, despite all of that, the Saints, for some reason, drafted him anyways. And like I said, this was a 10th round pick. At the end of the day, whiffing on Santos meant absolutely nothing in the grand scheme of things. 10th round picks usually don't even so much as play a snap in the league. So it's no harm, no foul for the most part. And there's a reason that the 10th round doesn't exist anymore and hasn't for roughly the last three decades. But still, a valuable word to the wise for any general manager who might be watching this video, and a word of advice that seems like common sense for any person with an IQ above 10, but apparently not for Jim Thinks. If you're on the clock and you're going to draft a player, make sure you actually like said player and want him to come. Don't order tacos for the whole office if you and everyone in the office hates tacos. Don't draft the guy if you don't like him and have nothing nice to say about him. Because when it came to the man they've been watching this whole time, San Diego State quarterback Todd Santos, drafting this Aztec bit the Saints in the, well, you know what. Get your official Jabble Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.